If you search the tag JRPG on Steam, you get approximately 2,700 games. You probably know popular games like these, but what about those little indie games that no one plays? Are they all trash or are there some hidden gems just waiting to be discovered? Well, in this series, I'm going to find out. I'll be scouring through Steam's JRPG tag to find games I've never heard of that look neat and share them with you. And starting out, we have the demo for Boncho Tactics. What caught my eye was its gorgeous pixel art style and also the fact that it's a strategy RPG. I guess I just can't get enough of those. The game is described as a strategy turn-based role-playing game in the Japanese gangster high school. Japanese and gangster are capitalized, so either that's the name of the school, which is awesome, or English might not be their first language. Should be fun either way. Let's take a look. So he plays this guy Arashi, and apparently there's some sort of power vacuum going on at his school as the previous baddest dude in the school graduated. Everyone seems to be trying to claim that spot. So the first battle begins with this group of hooligans at a convenience store, which is a pretty cool setting, something very different that I've never seen before. The only problem is that this map is really small and there's basically no terrain. The combat mechanics are also really shallow too. You don't really have a big moveset and there's nothing else unique about it. Some characters have weaknesses and you'll do a little bit more damage, but that's about it. Overall, that first battle was pretty easy. Next, there's a little cutscene showing off different gangsters in different schools, and I really like this presentation style. Again, I really like the pixel art, and the character portraits look great as well, not to mention some pretty solid music. Now, the second fight is in a classroom. Now, you do have terrain with all the different desks, but it's really small once again, and it's super easy to get stuck. I mean, just look at Arashi over here. He can't even move around fallen characters or his own teammates, which seems like an oversight because in other strategy RPGs, your teammates kind of just get out of the way and you can move around them. So I'm just stuck here waiting. Now, I had to play the battle twice, but eventually I was able to win, and that's where the demo ends. It's about 20 minutes long. Now, trying to keep in mind that this is a demo and not the full game where things could change, here are my thoughts. I really like the art style and the overall presentation. It's neat, and I like the idea of battles between school bullies fighting in everyday locations like convenience stores and classrooms. That's really novel. My biggest problem, though, is with the combat. It's about as bare bones as it gets. You move and attack, and that's pretty much it. It's ignoring the strategy part of the term strategy RPG. Now, in the trailer on the Steam page, it does show other bigger levels with more characters, so I'm hoping the full game is more interesting, but that demo didn't leave a great first impression. All right, next up we have Cupid Story First Date. This is a free game from Supernova Games and it's described as a small RPG dating sim in the Cupid Island universe. The Cupid Noelia has a mission, get the human Daniel a girlfriend in 14 days. Well, you guys know I love Persona, so the idea of an indie studio mixing up turn-based RPG and dating sim gameplay intrigues me. So let's take a look. You start off playing as Noelia, an angel who wants to become a Cupid. To prove herself, she needs to help out the lost cause named Daniel. Now the game starts off with Daniel getting bullied and his childhood friend Anna coming to his rescue. It's a great way to kick off the game because one, it shows that Daniel is kind of a wimp, two, it teaches you the combat mechanics, and three, it kind of gives the early edge to Anna in terms of what character you want to date. So here's the basic game loop. You have three times a day to choose an action, which can be interacting with one of the three love interests. Noelia can go back to heaven to earn some money to buy items, and then at night, Noelia can investigate one of the three girl characters. Now that sounds creepy, but it's actually pretty innocent. Noelia goes into their room to learn more about them, like reading their journal or going through their drawers. And then once she learns extra knowledge, this can help out Daniel in the interaction sequences. The more you interact with each character, the more your relationship level increases. At certain levels, you can unlock date spots to take characters to, like parks or a mall. And here's where you get into combat. Usually in each date, it'll consist of three battles, and enemies have some kind of issue where you don't have to physically fight them, but you kind of have to use harsh language or logic or something. So for example, there's one time where you're at the mall and there's a giant mob and you have to kind of distract them so you don't get trampled. It's simple, but fun and often hilarious. There's one instance where you tell a guy that he looks dumb in his sunglasses and that hurts his ego and removes his HP. Or there's this guy in a hot dog costume who hurts you by splashing ketchup and mustard on you. It's so silly, but so fun. And there were actually some shockingly compelling story moments where you get to learn about each character. And this might surprise you for something that looks like it's a flash game right out of E-Bomb's world? Drop a comment if you know what that means. Now, I really don't want to describe more of it because a single playthrough only takes about an hour and I want you to discover everything for yourself. Now, what did I think of the game? Honestly, I kind of loved it. 
At a glance, you look at it and it's free and it looks low budget, but it's shockingly fun and compelling. It was so good, in fact, that when I completed Anna's route, I immediately played through Claire's route next. I will say that there are diminishing returns with each new playthrough as each date more or less plays out the same way, just with different story revelations. I also really like the art and music in the game. Yeah, it's budget, but I don't know, it just sort of worked for me. If you like games like Persona, Trails of Cold Steel, or Soccer Wars, you gotta check this out. It's short and free, so you don't really have much to lose. Next up, we have Ignis Universia Eternal Sister Saga DX, which is also free. The description says this is a short game with a long name. It mashes up JRPG battles with visual novel storytelling. Not entirely serious. I like the vibe I'm getting from it already. Let's check it out. Well, they weren't kidding when they said the game was short. I beat it in about 40 minutes. I'll keep my review of this game short as well as not to spoil it, but imagine if Deadpool designed a short JRPG and you basically have Ignis Universia. It's about banding together four female heroes with the classic RPG classes and then defeating the big bad guy. It's very tongue-in-cheek, constantly breaks the fourth wall, referencing things like its own Steam reviews and other indie games, and it's actually a solid game. The sprite work here is pretty fantastic as well, and that battle theme has no right to be as jamming as it is. If you have an hour to kill and this game looks fun, I'd check it out. Now, the game encourages you to try the demo for the upcoming sequel, Awakening of the Erudite Empress. Well, while we're here, let's take a look. So you play with the same four characters, but now it's in full 3D and you can actually explore areas. In Sister Saga DX, it was kind of a point and click adventure with turn-based battles. There really wasn't any exploring. Here you can actually walk around, swap characters, and you have environmental abilities like smashing objects or moving objects telepathically. I like that the developers are challenging themselves with different mechanics and presentation styles. The character portraits in particular look really fantastic. Combat is fairly similar with each character once again fulfilling a specific RPG role. It also retains that same tongue-in-cheek, fourth-wall-breaking humor. Now, in an attempt to increase the game's production value, I feel like it's lost a bit of its charm. To me, there's something inherently appealing about quality pixel graphics, and I think that's part of the problem. This new 3D style looks cheap. I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just keeping it real. Now, I have a feeling that these games are more of a learning experience rather than a genuine attempt to make money, because otherwise, why release a game for free? So as a learning experience, I hope the team learned a lot. But of the two games, I vastly prefer Eternal Sister Saga DX. And let me say this, visuals go a long way for me, but might not bother others as much. So if you want to check out the demo, it's about as long as Eternal Sister Saga DX, about 40 minutes, and it's totally free. By the way, this video was a blast to put together, so if you're enjoying it so far and want more like it, definitely like the video and consider subscribing. It helps out a ton. Next up, we have Learn Japanese to Survive Hiragana Battle. And this was gifted to me by my buddy and longtime supporter of the channel, Asian Sensation 24 So thanks for gifting me the game, dude. <laughs> From what I understand, this is supposed to help you learn Japanese, specifically the hiragana alphabet, by playing through turn-based battles against letters. It seems like a really neat idea, but I'm curious to see how effective it'll actually be at teaching Japanese. Well, only one way to find out. So at first, you meet a Japanese girl who's here to teach you some basics of Japanese. You'll be shown a letter, have audio play that shows you how to pronounce it, and then it'll show you how to write it. The game encourages you to actually practice writing and saying the letters out loud, which I would also encourage. At first, it seems monotonous and kind of boring, like I could just get a book and do this myself. But then here's where the real genius of this game comes in. Once you're done with your lesson, you have to go out to a dungeon area and fight monsters. These monsters are the hiragana letters you just learned about. And the only way to deal damage is to choose the correct pronunciation. If you choose the wrong one, you'll deal zero damage and need to try again. So through pure repetition and in the guise of a turn-based RPG, you actually start learning the alphabet. I was kind of shocked at how effective this was. For English speakers, the Japanese alphabet is very challenging, but eventually you'll kind of start building your own association with the different symbols. And after a while, this magical moment occurs where you learn enough letters and start learning words. And as a giant weeb that watches a lot of anime and plays a lot of JRPGs, I know some Japanese words that use these letters, and I started to piece together words on my own. It felt so satisfying to figure out those words and it was just so fun. Now, I did stop playing after about an hour and a half because I wasn't really in the mood to keep learning, but of all the ways you could learn Japanese, this is one of the most creative ones I've ever seen. It's not really a great game, it's pretty basic and made an RPG maker, but if you're trying to learn Japanese, this could be a really fun supplement to your learning journey. It's only $6.99, so it's not a huge investment. Next up, we have Cesspool. The jokes just write themselves. Now, to be fair, this was made by a French developer, so maybe they don't understand what that is, but either way, that's not a good name for a game. Now, what 
intrigued me about this game was its pixel art and its description that says it's a JRPG where actions are done through mini games. I'm hesitant about that idea because it always sounds neat on paper, but then gets really annoying and tedious over the course of a full game. Either way, let's take a look. Yep, I was right. In combat, every action is tied to some kind of timed button press, whether it be a combo, holding a button, or hitting the correct direction to dodge an attack. It starts off novel, but quickly becomes annoying. Cesspool's translation in English is also very rough. They say things in ways no one would actually say them, and it just feels Google translated. So between those two factors, it made it very hard to enjoy this game. Outside of that, the actual design is quite good. The game does a great job of guiding you from one objective to the next without feeling too handholdy. That may not sound like a big deal, but when you play as many games as I have, you quickly learn that not every game does a great job of that. I also want to give particular praise to this one puzzle section where you have to push around boxes to find key cards and passcodes. Again, it doesn't sound very exciting, but as a player, it felt very satisfying to solve. The pixel art isn't the best I've seen, but it's pretty solid. I think it's helped by this sort of CRT scanline filter that's over the entire game. I'm not sure if it would look quite as good without it. For only $4, it's a pretty solid little game. If your tolerance for timing-based combat is higher than mine, then you might enjoy this. Next up is a game I've had on my Steam wishlist for a while, A Magical High School Girl. Its description really intrigued me. You can freely name your magic. The elemental properties and effects are generated automatically with what you type in. I don't know if I've ever heard of a system like that in a game before. It almost sounds too good to be true for a little indie game that's $10. But then I looked at reviews and everyone seemed really impressed. One even said that they named a spell Kamehameha and it worked. Well, color me intrigued, let's check it out. So right off the bat, I'm learning that this game is not exactly what I was expecting. Based on the trailers, I thought this might have been some kind of action dungeon crawler, but what it actually is, is a mystery dungeon style game. For those that are unfamiliar, it's basically a grid-based dungeon crawler where every time you take an action, the enemy will also take an action at that same time. So you either move at the same time as the enemy, or you attack and they get closer, things like that. Probably the most famous of these would be the Pokemon mystery dungeon games, if you've ever played those. This isn't a detriment, it was just not what I was expecting. So I created a few spells and yeah, whatever you name it, it kind of actually functions like the name. I made something called Sakura Bomb, hoping it would be like an explosion of flowers, but instead you just chuck a giant bomb. And I also couldn't help myself and I had the name one Kamehameha and yeah it also works. I'm really digging this so I'm gonna play some more and then come back with my final thoughts. So after playing for about three hours, here's what I think. The gimmick of naming your spells and then the game coming up with attacks to match the names is really novel at first, but quickly loses its luster. By the time I finished playing, I had a giant list of spells, but since you can only equip four at a time, I ended up just sticking to four that I preferred. The naming spells gimmick basically becomes irrelevant at that point, and all I was left with was the gameplay, which wasn't bad. The minute-to-minute -minute gameplay of exploring a map, fighting enemies, collecting healing items, and finding the exit to the next area was satisfying. The one thing that annoyed me though was that your health and mana to cast spells were pulled from the same resource pool. So if you're low on health, you basically can't attack. And I don't play mystery dungeon games, so I'm not sure if this is common, but it was really frustrating. What compounds this frustration are the healing items you get. More often than not, they give you some kind of debuff that hurts you, so it's almost pointless. If fewer items gave you debuffs, or if your mana and HP were using different resource pools, I think I would actually really love this game. The game loop is quite fun. However, these factors frustrated me just a little too much to keep playing. If you're used to these mechanics and like mystery dungeon games, then you might dig this. For only $10, it's a really well-made, charming little game. All right, lastly, we have Mr. Saito. So I'm just gonna skip right to the review here. Just go play it, trust me on this one. To give just a little primer so you know what it is, Mr. Saito is a story-focused puzzle adventure game about a Japanese businessman struggling to find purpose in his life, but told through this very strange yet charming fantasy world. It really isn't a JRPG at all as there's no combat or RPG elements of any kind. That said, this was one of the most emotionally resonant games I've played in a very long time. The best thing I can compare this to is Journey. It's very short, maybe 90 minutes, yet very powerful. After completing this game, I just cried and sat in silence thinking about life for a good 30 minutes to an hour. I know it looks weird, but I'm asking you to trust me on this one and just go play it. I promise it'll be the best $12 you'll spend on a game all year. Now, just for fun, if I were to rank them all, it would look something like this. Now, I'm going to exclude Learn Japanese to Survive as it's not really a game. Hands down, my favorite of this bunch, though, was Cupid Story. I had such a great time from beginning to end and was sad there wasn't more for me to play once I finished. I would love to see what this team could do with an actual budget and flesh this idea out into something bigger. Now, if you want to hear about more hidden gem JRPGs, be sure to check out this video right here. 
And special thanks to Reset Switch, Tyler Kuzava, and the Miyazaki Man for supporting me over on Patreon. To get exclusive videos and other cool perks, consider supporting me over on patreon.com slash thegamingshelf. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.